We are privileged to have this evening Mr. Andrew Oak. I hope I pronounced it right, okay. Mr. Oak is the author of The Unusual for Their Time on the Road with America's First Ladies. He is an award-winning television and multimedia producer from the University of Maryland. Andrew started his production career in music, recording and touring with his band in the 80s and 90s. Soon after that, he added his camera to the mix and all of the pieces fell into place. A storyteller from a young age, Andrew enjoys the art of communication and will go anywhere in the world for more knowledge, greater understanding, and amazing stories. Andrew has spent time traveling to nearly every location that helped tell the stories of every First Lady of the United States for the C-SPAN series, First Ladies, Influence and Image. He covered Martha to Michelle. He spent time in libraries, museums, homes, schools, birthplaces, cemeteries, train stations, and churches. His research and travels continue with the current First Lady, Melania Trump. What Mr. Oak discovered was that many of our presidents married up, and most of these men would not have made it to the White House, big surprise, without <laughs> their help, influence, and support of their lives. Nearly all of our parents presidents married a woman who was unusual for their time. He is here tonight to tell us the inside story. It is my pleasure to present to you Mr. Andrew Oak. Thank you very much. Hello and good evening, colonial dames, honored guests, and gentlemen, <laughs> I first want to say that this is absolutely, without doubt, the only group I've spoken to in my many years of speaking that actually held their applause when instructed to <laughs> when all the honorees were announced. Give yourselves a round of applause for that, because that does not happen. Really, really uh, impressive, to say the least. Welcome to Washington, D.C., my hometown, our nation's capital, named after George Washington, the capital of the United States of America. It will not surprise anyone in this group when I say behind every great man is an even greater woman. And these are the women that I found along my travels when I produced the C-SPAN series, First Ladies, Influence and Image, along with a wonderful team of producers and staff at C-SPAN that I had the good fortune of working with, and it was a privilege to be a part of their project. It made me the first ladies' man. <laughs> As I traveled the country for a year and two months with seven bags of gear, tirelessly gathering these stories of these women, these women before, during, and after the White House, I logged a lot of miles. My feet got very tired. I needed prescription glasses. A shot of Novocaine, or cortisone rather, in my back. Novocaine might have helped as well. <laughs> cortisone in my hip. About three rounds of Z-Pack for walking pneumonia. But every TSA agent at BWI knew me by name and breezing through security was a pleasure. But along the road, I discovered that these women, these unpaid, these unelected women, were remarkably more part of the story than I had ever been taught or ever realized. They are the most powerful and influential unpaid and unelected women in the world. Washington, D.C., George Washington. We all have him on money in our wallet. He's number one on Mount Rushmore, but he married up. It will not surprise anyone in this room, I'm sure, to know that Martha was married before George Washington. Daniel Park Custis. Daniel Park Custis left her a widow at the age of 26. He also left her probably the most eligible woman in the colonies with 8,000 some acres of profitable tobacco land, about a quarter of the real estate in Williamsburg, 
and three to four times the Virginia state governor's annual salary in silver cash on hand, George Washington met a very attractive, a very young, and a very wealthy woman. And then he came home to his new bride, and he said, honey, I got a crazy idea. I'm going to overthrow the king and queen of England. <laughs> what do you think about that? And not only that, I'm going to need your money and your privilege and your status to do it. <laughs> and while I'm gone, I need you to manage that 8,000 acres, that quarter of the real estate in Williamsburg, the wealth. Oh, and by the way, when you're not busy doing all that, can you come and visit me during the winter encampments of the Revolutionary War? Because I need your counsel and I'm going to need to bounce a few things off you. And you're going to need to organize some diplomatic parties for the people that are funding this fiasco. In modern times, if I went home and said to my wife after this speech, Honey, I'm going to overthrow the U.S. government. I bet you they take away my sky miles. <laughs> this is incredible. It is not an exaggeration to say that one of the greatest countries in the history of world that has influenced modern times almost beyond any other country ever lays squarely on the shoulders of a 26-year-old widow living outside of Williamsburg, Virginia. If he had married any other woman, the outcome would have been very different. That's a different kind of lady than I was told lived in the White House. That's a different kind of woman. That's a different kind of human being in general. What we collectively know about these women is typically their time in the White House. But I wanted to get to know the women before, during, and after the White House. I wanted to learn everything I could, leave no stone unturned. Influence and image. Image is pretty easy. We've got paintings, we've got etchings, later we have photographs, we have video. I was creating video as I was out in the field doing the work for the C-SPAN series. But how do you talk about influence? How do you display that on TV? Trip number two. Quincy, Massachusetts, Abigail Adams. The Massachusetts Historical Society has over 70,000 pages of Adams family correspondence. I didn't look through all 70,000 pages, <laughs> but pretty close. And I saw some pretty cool stuff. How many people in this room are familiar with the phrase, remember the ladies? Do you know what it says around that? Because I do. I held the letter. That is a magical letter to hold. Abigail Adams said in the late 1790s when our country was being formed, the Congressional Congress was assembling, and these gentlemen were first running for president and vice president, she said to her husband in letter form, remember the ladies. When you have them on your side, the men will be in your favor. Now, I'm very happy to see some gentlemen in the room tonight, because they'll back me up on this. <laughs> when you all are in your homes at certain points and times throughout your lives, as it is in mine today, as recently as today, and you are sitting in your living rooms in front of your big smart TVs, who's holding the remote? <laughs> There's one in every crowd. Of course you are holding the remote. I'm holding the remote. I'm the man. I have control. I have remote control. But who's picking the shows? <laughs> Abigail Adams knew hundreds of years before women would vote, before proper education, before formal education, before they could legally own land, before electricity, that men were holding the remotes 
and women were picking the shows. If Colonial Andy goes home, my wife is sitting on the couch, and I say, the election's tomorrow, honey. She says, well, who are you voting for? I, said, well, I was going to vote for John Adams. She said, well, that's the dumbest thing I've heard you say since I met you. <laughs> but if Colonial Andy comes home and says, honey, the election's tomorrow, and I'm voting for John Adams, and she says, that's the smartest thing I've heard you say since you asked me out. And I say, you're right, I'm a smart man. <laughs> and I go down to the corner pub and I buy pints of grog and ale for all my friends. And I say, boys, you're looking at a smart man. My wife said so. <laughs> Abigail Adams knew that men were holding the remotes and women were picking the shows. These are remarkable women. These are women that are unusual for all men, women, children, animal, Martians, aliens, anyone of their time. And they helped create one of the most influential countries in the world in modern times. And many of these women leave legacies, and we can't name them. I certainly couldn't have before I started the project. I didn't set out to become the first lady's man. I was in the right time at the right place with the right friends who were working at C-SPAN and said, we got a little project we thought you'd be perfect for. That's when I packed up those seven bags. That's when I traveled across the country for a year and two months. And that's when these women introduced and revealed themselves to me in letters and places and situations that I was never going to be before that I was never taught about in school, that I never would have discovered on my own. Abigail Adams. There's another Abigail. Nope. Close. Abigail Fillmore. Right. Who? <laughs> Not only was Millard Fillmore's administration cut short as he died in office, Sadly, Abigail Adams has, Abigail Fillmore, got a lot of ladies running around in my head. Cut me, cut me a little bit. <clears throat> Abigail Fillmore had the shortest life outside of the White House. When her husband died, she didn't know where to go. She moved in here to the Willard Hotel. She died in this hotel weeks after leaving the White House mourning her husband. Yeah, so if you see someone wander in the halls in a ghostly, wispy, uh, come on, this is a historic hotel in D.C. You think there's not ghosts in here? <clears throat> Just say, Abigail, and, you know, maybe, maybe that'll get you somewhere. But before this distinction, Abigail Adams moved into the White House, not in the best health. A lot of the first ladies moved in in not very good health, and they had their daughters and other people. That's another thing that we really don't understand on a regular basis. These women, these wives of the presidents, don't have to be and often did not take the duties or roles or challenges of first lady. They gave them to their daughters, president's nieces, president's sisters, other people stood in when there was no first lady in good health or no first lady at all to take this role. Abigail Fillmore was one of those first ladies that wasn't in the greatest of health. But when she moved into the White House, she discovered that there was no library. She is one of two first ladies that taught her future husband. Abigail Fillmore taught Millard Fillmore in East Aurora, North New York State, as a librarian and a school teacher. Abigail Fillmore is also the first first lady with a day job, as she was a paid school teacher and tutor. But when Abigail Fillmore moved into the White House, she was astonished that there was no library. So she said, we need to fix this. She organized a dinner and brought members of Congress to the White House, got everyone chatting. This is how these women politicked and hostessed from the very, very beginning. And she got a rather large sum out of the early Congress that others had not to work together with the Library of Congress to start the first White House library. 
Yet some of us in this room, myself included, before this project, didn't know Abigail Fillmore existed. Think of the world without America. Think of the difference in World War I, World War II, a global world economy, things near and dear to my heart, Harley-Davidson motorcycles, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Apple computers. The world is a different place without America. And these women that we can't name or didn't know by name helped contribute to that in the most significant of ways. When I say Roosevelt, you say wrong. <laughs> Not wrong, of course. There's an Eleanor Roosevelt, and I understand why you said that. Good pick. And if you didn't say that, this next part of my speech wouldn't have worked so well, so thank you. <laughs> but there's another Roosevelt, Edith Roosevelt. Often these women are overshadowed by men with huge personalities. Theodore Roosevelt was one of those. But when Edith Roosevelt moved in as the first first lady of the 20th century, after the assassination of William McKinley, President McKinley, she had a lot of things to be concerned about. Number one was the safety of her large family. She had six children. Seven if you include Theodore Roosevelt, which I do. <laughs> she had no room. The White House didn't look like what it looks like today. We're within the shadow of the White House, basically, here. When you look at it, when you see it on TV, you see the center residence part, where the president typically walks out across the South Lawn to get into Marine One, to fly off to wherever. You see the Washington Monument in the background. You see the East Wing and the West Wing. Next time you see that, thank Edith Roosevelt, because she's the one that, again, went to Congress and demanded action. She said, there's no room for my family in this house. I know that you have to conduct business here. I understand what the place is, but I'm also a mother. Something else to think about these women. They're moms. Being a mother, so I'm told, and so I've seen with my own eyes, is one of the hardest jobs in the world. Imagine doing it in public, on the world stage, even in Edith Roosevelt's time, on a constant, basically daily basis. Americans have always wanted a piece of these first families. Think of them as our own. They want to see the children, know the children, know the brothers, know the families. This was no different with the Roosevelts. So when she moved into the White House, she said to Congress, we will have an East Wing for entertaining and the important dinners. We will have a West Wing for business to be conducted and offices. And my large family will occupy the middle residence. Then what she did, because the American people could not get enough of this active family. I mean, this was like a traveling circus that moved into the White House when the Roosevelts came to town. They literally, they had giraffes, hyenas, ponies named Algonquin, giant macaws, dogs, uncountable amounts of animals. So she got all the kids together. She said, get in your Sunday best. Grab your favorite animal and head out to the lawn. We're taking pictures. Every family's got that favorite tree. My niece and nephew down in Huntsville, Alabama, send me pictures every school year. First grade, second grade, standing by that tree in the front yard. Got eight, nine, ten of them. The only time you know you can tell the difference, other than they're growing in size, is what number of fingers they're holding up kind of thing. Easter time, my dad and I go to visit. Let's get in front of the tree. The Roosevelts were no different. These are real people, folks. And Edith grabbed that large family and went out to the White House with one of the top photographers of the day and took a ton of pictures. <laughs> Theodore III is holding their giant blue macaw, Yale. Uh, Quentin is up in a tree in his little sailor hat. Uh, 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 Edith is holding, uh, or, uh, Ethel rather, is holding Jack the Wonder Dog. And then what, what Edith Roosevelt did was she was the first first lady to manipulate the modern press. 
She released these pictures and called Vanity Fair, Red Book, the magazines of the day, and said, okay, come on in, do another feature on my family. Here's your pictures. Here's what they're doing. Here's what's going on. Now get out. <laughs> and that satisfied the American public. They were happy with that. They thought, this is okay. We've got our little piece of these children, this active family. But it makes you think that even back then, before television, before video, before 24-hour news, before the internet, people could not get enough of these families. But they're still families, and they're still trying to maintain some sort of normalcy in raising these children, especially as mothers, while they're trying to set examples not only for women, but charitable endeavors and philanthropic endeavors around the world, on the world stage. These are massive amounts of, of, of exposure, massive amounts of responsibility for an unpaid, unelected role that we expect so much out of. I want to save you guys some time during the brief question and answer that I will provide at the end. Because someone will ask, who's your favorite first lady, Andy? It's nearly impossible. I know too much to pick a first, pick a favorite. But if I had to, because I can tell looking around the room, you ladies will not take no for an answer. <laughs> Lou Hoover. Right? <laughs> Who? You know the Johnny Cash song, A Boy Named Sue? Yeah, yeah. This is a girl named Lou. Her father wanted a son and named her Lou. It says Lou Henry on her diploma from Stanford University where she was the first woman in America to graduate with a geology degree. She traveled around the world and became a self-made millionaire with her husband, one of two orphaned presidents. The Hoovers are also the first of now three administrations not to take a salary. Can you name the other two? Trump is one. Kennedy, very good, very good. If, if, you don't, if you don't know the answer from here on, guess Kennedy or Roosevelt, the odds are in your favor. It's a little something I like to throw out just so everyone has a good time. But Hoover started it, then Kennedy, and now Trump. The Hoovers didn't need that money. The Hoovers didn't want that money. If the Hoovers had existed in a modern world of PR, marketing, 24-hour news, TV, we would have a much different memory of these people. They're probably the two most capable human beings that ever lived in the White House. The work they did before the White House is remarkable. Not to mention what they did during the White House. But remember earlier we were talking about things getting overshadowed. The Great Depression overshadowed the Hoover administration. There was nothing no man, woman, child, or animal could have done to cause that singularly or solve it in four years, probably even eight. But Mrs. Hoover had something. She had something from the very beginning. When she was a teenager, she wrote an essay called Independent Girl. This is in the late 1800s. And she wrote an essay about an independent girl who would go out and challenge the world and find her equal and either come together in a cataclysmic clash and rise together or bounce completely off each other in opposite directions. And in geology class at Stanford University, she found her independent man to match her independent girl. And what the two of them did around the world before, during, and a little bit after the White House is truly remarkable. And a first lady that we wouldn't think of if we were thinking of 5, 10, 15, 20 first ladies. What the Hoovers did when they lived in the White House was they needed to find a summer White House. All the presidents, not all, a, a lot of them did. Lincoln's Cottage is right outside of Washington, D.C., in northwest uh, Washington, D.C., um, uh, where, where Handfuls of presidents spent time during the summer. Get out of the swamp, out of the malaria, out of the heat. Uh, Washington wasn't 
always the uh, glamorous place you see around you now. <laughs> but presidents and their wives would find these summer retreats. And the Hoovers had been around the world. And when he was taking a long skyline drive, Lou and Herbert Hoover, he looked out over the valley with his wife and they said, this is one of the most glorious views I've ever seen in my life. Lou agreed. So what they did was they marched in on horseback, found a little piece of land right at the meeting of two rivers where the president could fly fish. Mrs. Hoover could have her Girl Scout friends out there, have campfires. She always had a campfire lit. She wanted that campfire smell, that outdoorsy feeling. And without an architecture degree, Mrs. Hoover designed her then second house that the Hoovers would design and live in together. I've seen the plans. She also taught herself seven different languages, Mandarin Chinese. While they were living in China during the Boxer Rebellion, as she wrote home to her friend, I believe her friend's name was Diane, and said, Diane, you're missing all the fun. My bicycle tires got shot out in Tiananmen Square today, and had I been able to grab my six-shooter off my hip fast enough, I'd have fired back. But man, you really should have come with us on this one. <laughs> Lose my kind of gal. But after they built their cabin called Rapidan Camp, which would later become a Boy Scout camp and a Girl Scout camp, they were celebrating the president's birthday at Rapidan Camp one evening, and a boy wandered in, set up on the table a cage, and in that cage was an opossum. And he said to the president on his birthday, happy birthday, here's your dinner, Mr. President. It's what we do in these parts. And the Hoover boys, I'm sure, had a similar reaction that some of you were. And I'm sure the president said something uh, 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 very nice like, well, we've already made dinner tonight, so we'll have the possum tomorrow. And perhaps we'll cook it later for a snack or something. And Secret Service gathered up the cage and hopefully just let it go in the woods behind the cabin. But Mrs. Hoover had other questions for the boy. Where do you go to school? I don't. How do you learn to read? I don't. Math? Nah. Well, Mrs. Hoover did what she always did when she saw a problem. And she did it without the help of the government. She did it without the help of fundraising. She dug into her own pockets, and she built a school. Then she hired the teachers and paid for their salaries. Then some of the students that would go on with the aptitude and the desire for college educations, she paid for their college educations. How do we know this? As the Hoovers were living retired after the White House in the Waldorf Astoria in New York City, when Mrs. Hoover died, in her personal desk, in her personal office, was a box. In that box was a stack of checks, uncashed. A lot of those kids tried to pay her back. She didn't want their money. She didn't want that kind of notoriety. She didn't want that headline. She didn't need that fame. The Hoovers did things, Lou in particular, because it was the right thing to do, not because she was going to get recognition, not because it was going to be headline on the news. It's a very special lady. And coming into this room before tonight, you probably wouldn't have named Lou Hoover if you were naming 5, 10, 15, 20 first ladies. It's a little bit of a spoiler alert if you're going to buy the books tonight, which I will have over there. I'd love to sign some for you and talk to you about them. Volume 1 is the 1700s and 1800s, Martha Washington through Ida McKinley. Volume 2 is the first first lady of the 20th century, Edith Roosevelt, on through Melania Trump. I was able to hold off publishing and writing the book until the election results and get some thoughts down, most of which have turned out correctly, I'm proud to say. But also, I'm very honored and proud to say that these books are published by Tactical 16, was an, in an independent military organization, veterans. So part of the profits of these books help veterans write and publish their own stories. We learned that that helps with PTS, getting their thoughts out, so we're very, very proud of that. But there's enough good stories in there that I don't feel like I'm spoiling them for you by asking this next question. Tell me who you think, I think, the most 
influential first lady, past, present, or future is? Nellie Taft. Nellie Taft. Oh, that's a good guess. Jackie Kennedy, another good guess, both wrong. And you listened because I said, say Kennedy or Roosevelt. So there she was listening. I threw you a curveball on that. There says, I didn't say it was 100%. I said the odds were in your favor. It's not Kennedy. It's not Barbara Bush, another excellent one. It is not Eleanor Roosevelt. But another good guess, Betty Ford. Here's the amazing thing I learned about Betty Ford. She never should have been first lady. Her husband wasn't even elected to the position that would put him into position to take over for Nixon when Nixon retired. <laughs> because he was appointed vice president when Agnew retired. Resigned, thank you. <laughs> Betty Ford did two things to help every single man, woman, child, and animal on earth. Cancer and addiction. Before Betty Ford, there were not breast cancer walks. You couldn't even say breast cancer. When it was written about in the newspaper, people had a fit. She did it all on the public stage and then went through addiction treatment. One of the Adams' daughters in the 17, 1800s, probably the 1800s, had a mastectomy. We, we did not invent cancer in the 20th century. Eleanor Roosevelt was walked down the aisle by her uncle, President Theodore Roosevelt, because her father had died after injuries from jumping out of a mental institution where they were trying to help him get off alcohol and opioids. We did not invent addiction in the 20th century. Betty Ford tirelessly and selflessly put herself out in front of both of these topics to create this awareness, to create discussions that are still going on today that would not have happened without Betty Ford. And she never wanted that role. She said very publicly, not doing her husband any favors politically or professionally, she said things on 60 Minutes about both and other things. And when Ford left the White House, he said in a 60 Minutes interview, more times than not, I agreed with my wife on those controversial issues. But even in the times I didn't, it wouldn't have mattered. Betty Ford was a very special lady that stood up and talked about things that were not being talked about. She's unusual for her time. All of these women, unusual for their time. Everyone in this room today, unusual for your time. You've traced your lineage. You know the importance of it. You know the importance of groups like this and being in this room. What we need to do is to continue to take a page out of the playbook of these first ladies and do things not because we're paid, not because we're elected, not even because we're expected, but we need to do things because it's just the right thing to do. And if all of us are a little more unusual for our time, like these women, the country and thus the world is a much better place to be. My name's Andrew Uck, I'm your first ladies man. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you. Um, I do have time for questions or, or not, if there, if there are. And if not, I can take questions over there. I'm, I'm yours for the evening. So we don't have, yes, please. Tell us everything you know about Reggie Jackson. 
everything I know about Rachel Jackson, how long do you have? I know a lot about Rachel Jackson. I read the letter at the Hermitage. I'm guessing you're from Tennessee. No? Oh. Okay. All right. Way to go, Tennessee. Have you been to the Hermitage? Yeah, it's fantastic. Fantastic. At the Hermitage, they talk about Rachel Jackson a lot. Um, Rachel Jackson is, unfortunately, part of one of the first political stunts of a campaign in a long time. And instead of telling you everything I know about Rachel Jackson, I'm going to give you some impressions which will be very enlightening as to an overall thesis I have about these women. What is good for one is not always good for another. And what is bad for one is not always bad for another. And it points directly to human beings, and particularly Americans, hypocrisy and mob mentality of what we put these women for to celebrate one for what we knock another down for, which is just unfair. Not that life is fair. But during the campaign of John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson, the first of two orphan presidents, Hoover is the second, Andrew Jackson the first, they said Rachel Jackson was a pipe-smoking, horseback-riding, hillbilly bigamist. It's not very nice, is it? Unfortunately for Rachel, a lot of that was true. In this sense, she did smoke a pipe. I know a lot of ladies that smoke cigars and were looked at very favorably. Oh, what a cultured woman. She knows fine cigars. And this very similar regionally down in the South at that time, I'm told. She had beautiful, beautiful China, a beautiful home, and was well loved by everyone around and entertained wonderfully. She was also very good at horseback riding. There was some discrepancies about when she was legally divorced from Robards, her first husband. And from what I hear, divorce is tough in 2019. I can imagine how difficult it was to get a guy that lived in the hills of Tennessee in the 1800s who was a drunk and abusive to sign some court papers. So maybe she was, maybe she wasn't, but she got out of an abusive relationship is the point. If you fast forward not too terribly far to the next administration, the Van Buren administration, you will find that his first lady or White House hostess was Angelica Singleton Van Buren. She was married to his eldest son, Abraham met at a White House dinner when her cousin, Dolly Madison, took her husband hunting at the White House. And she fell in love with the president's son and became the first lady. Here's what they said about Angelica Singleton Van Buren. A beautifully Southern cultured and finished equestrian. <laughs> Isn't that a horseback riding hillbilly in different terms? So, I mean, sure, she was about 20, 30 years younger. It's just not fair, you know? And it's okay to say, I think, out loud, it's not fair because there's some things that we take in life, okay, it's not fair, you didn't get picked first for the baseball team, you'll get over it. But the stuff that happens to some of these women, Rachel Jackson in particular, because I've read the letter, I've held the letter, where Andrew Jackson writes to his friend in December of, 19, of 1820, don't hold me to it, but I think it was 23, 1823. A month before he's to be inaugurated, he writes to one of his closest friends about watching his wife take her last breath. And the way he describes, he was a fan of dramatic, drastic medicine. I believe they tried bloodletting at the time, and it was a heart attack from what they basically say. It was the stress. A lot of people, even well, coming up in the next year, you will hear these words. I promise you. You will hear that this is the worst 
election in our history. The meanest, the nastiest, the rudest, the crassest. We heard it last time in 2016. I think Andrew Jackson would disagree because he lost a wife over it. And it's interesting to see how they would twist an older woman from the same region doing the same stuff to a younger woman in the press and in the media. I learned a lot about Rachel Jackson and a lot about uh, her, her niece. It's, it's actually one of the most fascinating periods of our country because it is a period when there is 12 years between Andrew Jackson and Martin Van Buren where we have no wife of a president, no official first lady. Emily Donaldson was uh, Jackson's first White House uh, hostess, a, a niece of his, of his wife, Jackson, a, 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 uh, an orphan, and, um, and, and then Angelica Singleton Van Buren because Van Buren's wife, Hannah, died about 20 years before he went into office. Um, and, and, and this is not unique. This is not, this is not unusual. Uh, even the third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, had no wife, and we had his daughter, Martha Patsy was her nickname. Um, Jefferson Randolph was his first lady hostess. And also Dolly Madison as the wife of the Secretary of the State at the time did kind of double duty on that. Um, uh, but but, but the, the, the circumstances that surround why Rachel Jackson died and why there's no first lady and why Martin Van Buren is even president um, 95 percent of the White House cabinet of Jackson's administration resigned. They quit. And that story is, 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 is a lot. And I, I, I do get into it in the book or we can talk about it separately. I want to leave some more times. But there's, there's, there's some perspective on Rachel Jackson. That's that it? I could keep going on Rachel Jackson then. No, I know you have other business to, to attend to and things like that. I will say once again, thank you very much. It is an absolute honor to be here in front of this group. I appreciate all the work you do and all the attention that you've given me here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, and we do have just a little token for you. Thank you very, very and this much. Was Absolutely fantastic, and we thank you. And he will be here autographing books afterwards. Thank so you very, very much. I look thank forward you. to it.